Hello and welcome to this edition of A Conversation With. I'm Jim Marshall of the New Bedford Cable Network and in studio with us I'm very happy to have President Laura Douglas of Bristol Community College joining us. As I said, I've never actually met you in person per se. We've kind of ha shook hands before and at different events, but it's, it's great to sit down and talk to you. I'm happy to have you on for the next half hour. It's great to be here. I love New Bedford and it's great to talk about what we're doing here in this wonderful city. Lots going on. Um, the fall semester, the 20, 2023, 2024 school year is off and running. Just give us an overview. How are things going right now at the start of the school year? Well, things are great. Actually, this is the first time in a very long time that we've had a positive uptick in enrollment. Uh, uh, we've been on the decline for a number of years. The pandemic hit that hit us hard in the community college level. Uh, so it's nice to be on the upswing. A lot of that has to do with Mass Reconnect, the new free community college program for adults who are 25 and older. Um, but we also have a lot of other great initiatives taking place. One is uh, we're opening up the National Offshore Wind Institute, uh, and we have uh, uh, just some new programs that seem to be doing very, very well. And we're excited that, you know, we've kind of come out of the pandemic and people are happy to be on campus again, and they are uh, invigorated to be back at college. That may, and you know, talking to different people here, uh, the work from home thing and things like that, and while people say it was great, they also said there were communication, the one-on-one, -on -one, people miss that. And I would, especially at college, when, when kids were, not in your case, of course, but not, they were just in dorms, or they weren't even mm -hmm. in dorms, it was all remote. There's a huge difference education-wise, and I think this goes without saying, when you're in a classroom, and your professor's right there and you've got your fellow students with you. Yes, there's a lot of energy and there's more engagement and that's a better environment for students, yes. Not that it can't happen online, right. but for so many of our, especially our young students, 18 coming right out of high school, they've really wanted that in-person experience. What has been, coming out of the pandemic, been the biggest challenge from your standpoint for higher ed and for specifically for Bristol Community College? I think the biggest challenge is that during the pandemic, wages increased, right? Especially those who had low skill levels. So maybe you were doing DoorDash or, you know, shopping at the local supermarket for deliveries. Um, there were really good paying jobs, $25 an hour, $30 an hour. You could, you know, bag groceries and still make a lot of mm -hmm, money. Yeah. And so for what, so what happened was a lot of people thought, well, I don't really need college. Why, why would I want to assume debt? Why do I need to go to college when I have these great wages? Not understanding that this was just a temporary moment in time. This is not going to be sustainable. And plus you may not like those types of jobs right. for the rest of your life. It's not a career, so to speak. So I think it was the notion that people shifted their minds from thinking, oh, I should go to college, I should think about a career, I should think about what's going to make me happy over my lifetime, to, oh my goodness, all of a sudden, I'm making a really good wage. I don't know that I really need college. And that's been something that's happened, uh, I think, throughout our nation. Uh, but I think this is the fall now where people, where people, where it's signified to folks that, yeah, being a DoorDash driver every day is really not that fulfilling. And I want a job that's really fulfilling. And the other piece that I see is that that people are noticing the community college. When we look at the national polls, um, uh, a lot of people have said, well, I don't have a lot of faith in higher education. And why is that? Mm. It's really because of debt. People don't want to incur a lot of debt. But they've, people have found the community college. And there are a couple of reasons why. First of all, we're very affordable. And at Bristol Community College, for example, 68% of our graduates have no debt. That's amazing. Right. So most people think, oh, college debt. That's not true. And the other thing is that people realize that they can do college in smaller chunks. So I can start with a certificate. I can get a good job. I can start off my career. Maybe I start in cybersecurity. I do a year-long certificate in cybersecurity. I get out. I can make $80,000 a year. My employer is going to help pay for the rest of my degree, which is the two-year degree, which is maybe the other year of that. I can do it part-time. I can do it online. It's flexible. Right. And then all of a sudden, I'm making a good wage. I have a career. I'm in demand. It's sustainable. Life is good. You do hear that from a lot of people right now that, well, college isn't for everyone and you know we can move on. But there is dollar values. The difference between a high school diploma 
and an associate's degree. Significant mm -hmm. va dollar value difference. And then, of course, it goes up with each degree that you get. Right. And, and the other thing that people are realizing is that there are a lot of degrees at a community college where you're actually making more money than a four-year bachelor's degree. And so when we think about a four-year degree or sometimes a two-year degree, you're going to be making it about a million dollars more in your lifetime, anywhere from 800000 to a million dollars more in your lifetime. And, and college isn't all about money. It's certainly about fulfillment. But, you know, it's, it's joyful when you can own a home right. and when you can take vacations and when you can access health care and that has a, there's a quality of life that comes with it as well that's extremely important to one's well-being. How has the college uh, course offerings changed? Has it changed significantly since COVID? I mean you still have your basics English, math, what have you but the selections, have they changed? Well, I think that we see that we are certainly, um, uh, we always try to align with our labor market data. So when we evaluate our programs, and we evaluate them every year. And she knows I'm leading into the wind industry, but that's okay. <laughs> We look at things like, you know, what's happening in this industry and are we teaching this and how are we, you know, putting all of these things together. So I would say that in the last few years we have seen some changes at the college. Um, one has definitely been in cybersecurity and IT. Right. It's a, a job where there are just more jobs than people who are trained to do those jobs. And with cyber attacks and cyber cybersecurity issues, it's just everywhere, a re everywhere, every industry. Every for, yeah, every industry, government, yeah. bit private, everything. Definitely ne necessary. So that's been a big one where we've put in a lot of uh, of resources. And then the other area, uh, we've seen a lot of push to healthcare because we. We were very depleted during the pandemic right. that's starting to come back but in new areas certainly offshore wind we have a, a degree program which is a two-year uh, basically an engineering degree in um, offshore wind and and uh, working basically the turbines and we also have a certificate which is a basic uh, a basic degree as well, which is servicing those wind turbines. Um, we also added supply chain management. We knew this wow. before the pandemic yeah. um, that in order to have a strong offshore wind industry, you need to have a strong supply chain. So what does that mean? Well, you need to have somebody who who makes the underwater sea cables that brings the energy from the turbine to right. land. You need to have someone who will build all the different parts of the turbine. You need realtors to help find housing for the people who are going to be relocating to the area to do these specialized jobs. You need hospitality and culinary uh, out on these boats that are working with the workforce out on the water, right? They need to be able to eat and watch a movie and relax and do all these other types of things. So you have all of these different pieces of the supply chain, uh, and that's the other piece that we uh, uh, launched. But of course, the pandemic just made supply chain ubiquitous. Everybody realized right. how important the supply chain yeah. was and that we could, in fact, companies could save a lot of money if they were much more planful in looking at, at supply chain. Uh, so those are some things that have been very, that have very much changed, but then we also added our National Offshore Wind Inst Institute, which is right on the uh, water here in New Bedford, uh, and that is slated to open very soon. Is Before we get to that, I'm curious, is that like a five-year plan or a 10-year plan, how do you look at industry like that to say the supply chain thing? How, I mean, is it just one year you're like, wow, this is really an issue, we gotta start something like this? Or do you see trends that you're going every maybe three, five years, we've gotta look and see what how this r works? Yeah, we look for trends, but we also subscribe to labor market data. Uh, the college, uh, we have a, uh, a platform, uh, it's called Lightcast, and we use that to be able to predict the shifting of jobs and needs in our area. So when, for example, um, one of the things that we look at is biomanufacturing. So at what point is Bristol County going to be ready for more biomanufacturing? We know that the hub for um, pharmaceuticals right now is in Cambridge, right? Kendall Square. However, we also know that to be a part of this industry, all you need to be is within a 60 mile radius of Kendall Square. So we see facilities building out in Norton, 
we see um, an R&D operation now here in New Bedford for vaccines. So we're beginning to see these pieces. So we have some uh, medical device companies, we see this. So we're waiting sometimes, we're watching for some of that critical point yep. that we get to, to understand, okay, now it's time for us to start thinking about biomanufacturing. How do we, how do we get ready to scale um, tra uh, trainees for this type of, of scenario? The offshore wind industry, as I was talking to you off camera, I mean, you're starting that from Scratch. ground zero. Um, how tough is that to start a program like that from that point? Where do you find the people? Right. Well, I was very lucky. Uh, uh, I'm originally from Massachusetts, but I came from Iowa before I came here to Bristol Community College, and we had a wind program there. A lot of people don't realize that in the Midwest, especially Iowa and Nebraska, there are, uh, you know, it's very flat, and those winds come howling. There's a lot of wind to capture, uh, and it was very wonderful for me to be a part of that um, industry. Our college trained for offshore uh, for uh, wind technicians. But as I lived in, in Iowa, and we were there for about 12 years, and I lived in the city of Des Moines, and it is a real city, mm -hmm. right? Real, you know, city, and I'm in my little neighborhood, and things are starting to change around me. And how do I know that this is kind of taking root? Well, first of all, I'm in Rotary, and a and the big wigs of Mid-American Mid Energy are in my Rotary Club, and they're talking about wind and all this other kind of stuff. But my neighbor to the left is a real estate agent, and she sells commercial real, real estate. She changed her entire business to leasing land from farmers to the wind companies wow. for these turbines. Then my neighbor to the right has a cattle farm outside of Des Moines, lives in Des Moines, has a cattle farm, and in the winter time, he started a business plowing around the wind turbines. Well, why do you need to plow around the wind? Iowa has a lot of snow. Right. You have to make sure that those wind turbines are always accessible if they break down. So you saw this. This is supply chain at its best, right? right. When we think about supply chain, it was permeating every piece of our community. And bringing that with me here to Massachusetts, we had already started doing research. We had been working with UMass Dartmouth and begun to uh, anticipate the change and working with our legislative delegation and talking about what it would mean. We really began to think about what we need to do. So first were the degree programs, the certificate and the degree pro programs, which are in the credit side of the house. Yeah. But then we began work, uh, finding land, working with the mayor's office uh, to try to find a place to offer a uh, very large one-stop training facility for offshore wind. Right. We know that you have to be, you have to have, first of all, a, you have to be accredited. Uh, and there's an international accreditation called Global Wind Organization. So we have just uh, gone through the accreditation process uh, so that we can teach basic skills. Uh, every person that goes out to a wind turbine has got to be certified in basic safety training. Right, so this isn't, uh, this isn't an industry where you can just come off the street and say, I'm nope. ready to go. All the thousands of people that are gonna be working this industry will need to be coming through Bristol Community College and have this training. And also we're working on basic technical training. We have to train them in this GWO uh, uh, training to be able to go out and service those wind turbines. Now we'll also have blade repair. Uh, one of the other things that we have at the, the NAWI, the National Offshore Wind Institute, is this big tank. It's a giant swimming pool. It's deep and wide and it has this really cool trans, trans um, this, uh, uh, this, this piece of equipment, which is basically a simulation of a helicopter. And it dumps you upside down in this oh, wow. tank, and you have to learn how to Figures. release yourself. <laughs> yeah. And uh, of course, we have sea survival and other things. Yeah. But this is gonna be, this has gone from, this would be nice to have, and we were planning for it and had the tank in place to, all right, speed that up, Bristol Community College, because we thought we were going out to the turbines by ship, but now with right whale issues, and it's going to take slower, take more time, it's gonna be more slow, four hours to go out, four hours to come back, that's an eight hour shift right there. Where do you do your work? Where do you, you know? Right. So now they're saying, 
Bristol, please help us. We need to get this Hewitt training online as quickly as possible because we're going to now be taking people out to the turbines via helicopter. Wow. So we have to not only provide the basics at our National Offshore Wind Institute, but we have to be listening to industry and we have to be ready to respond to their needs so when they need new skill sets we're ready to go but that's the relationship that we've built with uh, the offshore wind developers as well as the um, OEMs we call them the original equipment manufacturers they're gonna be like the Siemens and the GE's they do the maybe the motor pieces of for this that or the right. other uh, we have a space that can be used for some of this proprietary training so GE can come in and say I'm gonna I'm gonna rent this room for two months and we're gonna be training on this and it can be their space uh, but this will completely support the offshore wind industry. It will allow them to be successful uh, and you cannot run an offshore wind in industry if you don't have trained professionals. Well it's very exciting too to start it. Huh. How important is it, Bristol Community College has a presence in all the four major cities mm -hmm. here in Bristol County mm -hmm. and obviously uh, now he is here in New Bedford plus you've got the downtown campus. How important is it for the college to be in the communities, not just the main campus in Fall River? Yeah, that's a great question, Jim. So, you know, we have a campus in Attleboro, one in Taunton, one in Fall River, and one in New Bedford. And these are each gateway cities, cities that have populations of people who really need access to education and training. Many of, our, uh, many of your viewers may not know that 15% of all adults in Bristol County do not have a high school diploma. That's high. Right. Right? You can't go to college and you, it's difficult to get trained if you can't read well, write well, if you don't have that basic start. Also here in Bristol County, County we have some of the lowest uh, college attainment rates at about 29% of our adults compared to about 75, 76% of all of Massachusetts. So we have some catching up to go. To, to go. We don't have transportation between our cities. It would be beautiful if we could get transportation and everybody into a place like Fall River or New Bedford. That can't happen. Yeah. We've had to set up these smaller campuses as, as really those gateways into higher education. We do a lot of adult education, well, high I, school. I was going to segue into that with the Mass Reconnect. Exactly. Which is... Um, uh, folks 25 and older mm -hmm. can come to go to a community college right for, for free. free right as long as you don't have a degree and we saw this fall just folks in droves so the community colleges were allotted 20 million for this first year alone uh, for uh, to award to folks for free tuition and fees uh, we spent a million alone this fall semester. We anticipate another million in spring. So two million out of 20 million, that's pretty good for one of 15 community colleges. We, our adults responded, but you can't go to college if you don't have a high school diploma. Right. And so we are, we have very strong programs in GED, high set, as well as English as a second or other language. Um, so we're helping our immigrant populations, we're helping those who dropped out of high school. Uh, they're really heartwarming stories. A lot of them are, go like this. You know, I'm a dad and I have a seven year old daughter and I dropped out of high school and I know how important school is. And if I'm gonna be a good parent, I'm gonna be a good role model and I'm coming back to school and those are the stories that we get every day. Uh, it's exactly what you want to see. And so uh, these investments in our four cities are critically important to creating the pathway for skilled labor, for educated adults, for those who are going to be our professionals and uh, the next generation of And it's always been said here, too, in this part of in southeastern Massachusetts, for, for many uh, families, you know, they're, they're, those kids are the first kids now to go to higher education because their mm -hmm. parents only got that high school diploma. That's right. And at, at Bristol Community College, still after all these years, you know, we started in 1965, um, about half of all of our students are still first generation college students. That's really important, right? And I tell people all the time, my greatest responsibility as president of Bristol Community College is to create a college-going 
um, community or uh, uh, climate uh, this advantage here in Bristol County because we still have families who don't see the value. And as soon as one person in that family goes to college, graduates from college, gets that job, and they say, oh my gosh, now I have health care. Now I have this, now I have that they begin to understand that that college-going culture is critically important to the, the future of families. So that's really what we're all about at Bristol Community College. And the community college isn't the same community college that your parents mm -hmm. might remember. I mean, like you and I were talking about uh, off-camera, there's sports. Mm -hmm. There's different programs now that are uh, more like mainstream colleges in a sense. Oh yes, um, and strong student activities, right? That's what I'm saying. Leadership yeah. opportunities, yeah. student senate, all of those things. And we have a lot of specialty centers as well. Um, we have a women's center and we have a parenting program to help our women and ma uh, male parents. Um, we have a multicultural center. We have a Holocaust and genocide center. We have a Luso which Center. Is, which is fantastic, both of those. I mean, we've seen the videos. You have a great um, video studio where those things go out. Unbelievable programs. Unbelievable programming, bringing in great speakers, and that's you know really important to what we do and supporting all of our students. We have a strong LGBTQ population uh, that uh, also is so well supported, and uh, you know that's just part of who we are. So we do rival in many ways uh, what a student would get at a, a larger four-year right. university. In in many ways, we are larger. Yeah. <laughs> than most, yeah. uh, uh, private, at least private institutions in Massachusetts, many of the privates are in this area. Well, let's mm -hmm. talk about, because we've got about five minutes left, but I want to talk just in general about the business of, of higher education, mm -hmm. and you and I were talking about that. Um, it just seems that there's a lot of people putting their fingers in to how higher education should be run and what should be taught and things like that. You talked about, which I didn't realize, you know, the cliff of 2025. Right. Um, I'm reading in the paper the small liberal arts schools mm -hmm. are closing. And you mm -hmm. gave me an astounding stat, which you mm -hmm. can talk about. Mm -hmm. What is the business of college like right now, or higher education? Yeah, it's really tough. Uh, obviously, COVID was not an easy part of higher education. Um, but we've been preparing for what we call the cliff of 2025 for quite some time. It's the point in which the 18-year-old, uh, uh, the number of 18-year-old or college-age students really starts to dip. And that was because our last recession, right, 2008, 2009, 2010, we had a lot of folks there who, um, who just stopped having children. And it was difficult, right, to survive. And when you can't afford to live, you don't have children. So that had an effect on the birth rate that we're now starting to see. And we will uh, continue to see that for quite some time. So with fewer 18-year-olds, it means there's more competition for that 18-year-old who's interested in mm -hmm. going to college. So in Massachusetts, we have more students graduating from high school than ever before. That's a plus. But of the students graduating from high school, we have fewer people who are wanting to go to college. And that's surprising. It is, a, it is surprising. It has to go back to what we started with at the beginning of the program. And this notion is, and it's false, is that I, if I go to college, I assume debt. And obviously that's not true at, at places like a community college or many, uh, many students who don't even take the time to recognize whether they're eligible for federal financial aid. So there is competition. We've had to be very mindful. And at Bristol, I take the attitude of we can either survive or we can and change and adapt, or we can just do things the way we've always done, and let's just see what happens to ourselves. And there are a lot of colleges and universities who just have been very resistant to change. They have their traditions, you know, we're bastions of tradition, right, at, at colleges yeah. and universities. We've always done it this way, we're not gonna change, but, but really to survive, we have the choice to survive. And we've been using technology to work smarter, um, we have uh, customer relation management platforms that allow us to work um, and uh, with, with students who are interested and get them admitted and enrolled quicker. It used to take us two months. It takes us two days now. 
that's important. Those applications back in the day without the... <laughs> right? We're in a texting <laughs> environment yeah. where you want immediate gratification. Right. That's what we, we work to, to achieve those things. So we have to work on those things uh, very, very carefully. I think we're going to see a lot of competition in the adult learner marketplace because that's one area where we can well, all you said, tap. You, you said you're growing, though, with that. Very right much at the start so. of the show, you said. Right. So those adults are going to be very important. So it is a competitive landscape. It's always been competitive to some degree but now it's more competitive and there are some people who are saying that in 10 years 20 percent of all college and colleges and universities in the United States will no longer be here because yes. those small less than a thousand students that kind of dot our landscape all over the nation are going to really really struggle to survive. Is it frustrating from your standpoint as an educator as the head of a large school and I'm talking nationwide now, to see that there are questions about the classes, the topics that are being taught, and I'm generalizing mm -hmm. now, throughout the country. Are we shortchanging education? Yeah, I think we are. You know, students also demand sometimes what we are teaching. They want certain topics, right? So when there's an, uh, uh, a need, so let's say, you know, we are at Bristol Community College, we're 65% women right so we have a lot of women and women are wanting to learn what does it mean to be a woman in the workplace would that be a course that could be of value to someone to understand how to navigate you know what is the history of women in the workplace how do you navigate that what are wages like how do you know those are could be courses that and that are very valuable to women so we have to be thinking about what is going to help our students do their very best how are they going to navigate in an ever-changing world how are they going to help us lead for the next generation so I think that colleges and universities do a very good job in identifying the courses and programs that meet the needs of their communities and their students uh, but there are some people who like to nitpick and come in and say well why does a student have to take a class on what does it mean to be LGBTQ well you know if we have a social work program or human services right we're training people to become social workers our highest suicide rates are amongst those who are transgendered those future social social workers have to understand these issues they need to know how to how to intercede and to provide the right level of support we don't want those people to be committing suicide right mm -hmm. so we've got to have these courses that really help us understand uh, how do we support people how do we do our jobs but yes there is interference we see a lot of that in the south obviously uh, but uh, we're just really trying to help people be the best professionals that they can be and to have a great understanding of all the different people in our community. Uh, and I would challenge anyone who came to me and said, boy, you're not teaching the right stuff at Bristol Community College because I, we certainly are doing a great job. And we have amazing faculty who are always trying to respond to these needs and rewrite curriculum or in, uh, introduce new concepts or not even as part of the curriculum, but maybe part of student activities and lectures and special programming to help uh, our community understand the needs and changes. For folks that are interested in going to BCC or want to learn more, how can they find out? Yeah, just go to bristolcc.edu on our website. That's a great place to start a little bit of exploring uh, and you can find a number to call. We have uh, wonderful folks in our admissions officers, uh, offices, uh, uh, also our academic advisors are, are ready to help someone maybe who's went to college, dropped out. I have these credits, what do I do? Um, we also give credit for prior learning. If you're a professional, someone who's been working in a field but don't have the credit that aligns with your skill, we can do an evaluation to give credit for that skill. So we're just standing by ready to help uh, people of all ages uh, be ready for college. It's great having you on. Thank yeah, you. Very nice. President Laura Douglas of Bristol Community College, thanks for joining us. We hope to have you on again. My pleasure. All right. That's going to do it for this edition of A Conversation With. I'm Jim Marshall, the New Bedford Cable Network. Thanks for watching and we'll talk to you again soon.